will start uh, today with a panel on artificial intelligence. So we're speaking, of course, <clears throat> in the period that the European Commission has suggested to strictly regulate artificial intelligence, and maybe there's word even of a ban on facial recognition. And we wanted to discuss uh, and take it a step further. So at what point do we say we actually want to ban artificial intelligence as such? So we will probably not arrive at this radical conclusion, but still we have three presentations that, um, that show you how intrusive artificial intelligence is. And the question is really to what extent can you adapt the law to suit for these changes artificial intelligence is making and at what point do we say no, here uh, artificial intelligence has to uh, stop. So we have Mark Hall as, uh, as moderator of the session. He's from the University of Luxembourg. Katharina Kramer, she's from the University of Göttingen. <coughs> yeah. Jean-Claudia Manchieri, he's from the the, this university here at, uh, at Brussels, the Vrije Universiteit, and Sylvia de Conca is my colleague at the University of Tilburg. And they will speak about personal data, um, intellectual privacy, and privacy of the home, respectively. Um, so I'm Bart van der Sloot, I've put together this, uh, this uh, session, but will refer myself to the room right now. Before I've said that I'm the editor-in-chief of the European Data Protection Law Review, the best and also most read journal on privacy and data protection in Europe. So you should get a subscription, and if not a subscription, submit articles, reports, case notes, etc., to our journal because we're also always looking for uh, good, good quality case notes, book reports, what have you. Okay, good luck to Katerina, I think, at first. Thanks a lot. Before Katharina starts, two words from me, and this is, uh, today you always have to say things twice because we are so overloaded with information, so you won't be surprised that me as an associate editor of the European Data Protection Law Review tells you you really need to read regularly our journal and uh, submit uh, articles, but I, I mention it for one other reason. We have every year here at the CPDP the Young Scholars Award, and I'm very honored to uh, chair a panel where we have very, very bright young scholars who potentially could also be um, submit, submitting their uh, papers, their theses, their uh, thoughts as a paper for our Young Scholar Award, which usually is held Thursday afternoons. And the top uh, five papers of that award always go into one edition of the EDPL. So it's really a nice shop window where you can display what you're doing at a ver very early stage of your career. So some of you in here I can see are also young scholars, so potentially next year we might have an intro or a paper by you in that uh, journal as well. I'm grateful to Bart for putting together the uh, panel, and he had one difficulty to do, apart from finding a good topic, which is easy in the context of this conference, but the difficulty was Friday morning, getting those of you awake that were at the party yesterday night, which traditionally, I was not there, so I don't know how long it went this time, but traditionally goes till very late. So after talking for two days about all aspects of AI and data protection, I have the feeling we are now asking the really relevant question, and that is, okay, can we ban AI? Or what do we do with this whole thing? And obviously, as Bart said, we're not going to cover the whole area, but what would we've tried to do, or what Bart has tried to do in selection of the topics is, there where it goes to our heart, to our intimate area, um, what are, we, what are we to expect from AI there? So we will first hear the presentations, and then um, we have hopefully a couple of uh, hot questions that will keep you nice and awake for the session. And with that, Katerina, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, the title of this panel is, as we already said, Can We Ban AI? And I have one very simple answer to that, I think. No, we can't. But I I think we wouldn't be here if we, if we would answer it this easily, which is why I'm going to talk about one AI technology in particular, which is emotion recognition technology. And this emotion recognition technology has been discussed at CPDP for a few years now. We've heard a really good discussion on Wednesday about emotion recognition in the context of um, children, which is targeted at children. But I want to take a little step back and make it a bit more general and want to look at emotion recognition in the context of 
or in the um, context of the concept of personal data. And I want to um, discuss whether the notion of personal data is still suited for emotion recognition technology, because there may be some issues with the definition. First of all, what is emotion recognition and why are we discussing it? Emotion recognition technology is a booming market which is estimated to have a compound annual growth rate of 32.7% uh, over the forecast period from 2018 to 2023. So reach, uh, expecting to the market to reach 24.74 billion US dollars by 2020. That is a remarkable market, which many people are not really aware of. Whenever I talked about this topic with people, no one had ever heard of the possibilities of, that emotions could even be analyzed or recognized, at least in my personal um, context. So what are emotion recognition technologies? Those are technologies that can sense and analyze human behavior, but on, not only outward behavior, but also inward physical processes. That can be, of course, the first that comes to mind, facial expressions, or also the voice, the gait, the gaze, or other, bo <coughs> uh, other body movements. Um, and on the internal state, we can analyze the heart rate, the temperature, so, or even respiration rates. And many of these can be analyzed from the distance, so you don't need body sensors for most of them. You can use simple cameras that are employed by now everywhere as CCTV, microphones, of course, infrared sensors, or even wireless networks, such as a simple Wi-Fi network. So now that we know what emotion recognition does, I want to turn to the question of what personal data is. Of course, most people may know the definition from the GDPR, but I want to um, yeah, remind everyone of that um, and then afterwards discuss this notion. The GDPR defines personal data as information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So when we look at the elements, a natural person is, of course, a human. We're looking at human emotions, so this is not problematic in the context of emotion recognition technologies. And everything these days is, is information. And then this information, if we look at emotions, inherently are linked to people, so they relate to humans. Where I see the problem is the notion of identified or identifiable, because an, an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identifier, and emotions other than a name are not identifiers. So we can see that the GDPR generally, or let's say even the whole data protection regime, sees identifiability as the intrusive way, and if it's non-identifiable, it's not problematic. So it does not fall under the data protection regime. I want to um, explain a little bit further how this is important when we look at emotion recognition technology and at the intrusiveness at, of emotion recognition technology. So let me give you one example, which is where we all can see, well, this has to be personal data. If most people of us probably have those loyalty cards of a supermarket, but this is already possible without a card where you, can use, and, uh, where you can use instead facial recognition. So you upload a photo to an app, and then in the supermarket you will be scanned and the, the program will recognize you and can follow you to the sh through the shop and can analyze your reactions to certain products, for example, whether you are happy in front of the um, the candy aisle, for example, or whatever you prefer. And here we can see, of course, this is definitely linked to an identified person because the person gave the information anyways. And then we have the, 
the opposite, where we do not have um, an identified or identifiable natural person. If we look at emotion recognition technology that can use radio frequency signals to measure heart rate, which is already possible from a distance, this, the, this uh, heart rate does not make a person identifiable. And this emotion data that is analyzed out of this also does not make the person identifiable. So here we have the, the problem that we would feel it is it might it feels intrusive to to have a commercial to have our emotions used for commercial interests for such as selling us more and um, creating more more revenue. But this data would not fall under the data protection regime. There is one more example I want to give to, to show that it's also not undisputed to whether where we have identification or identifiability or not. There is, this, um, there is an example of a billboard that changes its advertisements according to the emotion you display. So if you look bored, for example, the, the, um, the screen will show you different information than a person who is happy with the information that is shown. And um, there are arguments to, that would say, even if this uses facial, um, your facial expressions in order to analyze your emotions, that that is still not um, personal data because you're not identifiable. I do disagree with that because, if, in my opinion, the, the face is always, um, yeah, if a face is analyzed, even if it's in real time, the facial features are analyzed, which makes a person identifiable. But this is still something that is not discussed to, to a full extent. So we've seen that emotion recognition technology is something that really regards our inner, inner feelings, our personality, our personhood. And it, these emotions can be exploited by different actors and the concept of personal data may not be suited to cover all user cases of this technology. So what are the implications for the notion of personal data in this case? We could of course say, let's just abolish the whole concept of personal data. Everything is personal data these days. Every, every data point relates to an identified or identifiable person. But that would probably be difficult in a, in a data-driven society where we have such, so many data that it would be hard to regulate all of them in, this, in the same way as the GDPR would, would um, say it's necessary. Or we could think about, do we need new category of data for emotion data, which is not linked to the identification requirement? Or we would say um, emotion data is always personal data, or emotion, or emotion data always falls under the GDPR, no matter whether it falls under this um, definition of personal data. That might be an issue regarding to the fragmentation of data protection law. So it could be difficult, especially if we look at the problem that there might be new emergent technologies that pose the same problem. So if they are there, we would have the same discussion and the same problem from the very beginning again. Or we could say, just, let's just get rid of this identification and identifiable requirement of the a notion of personal data. This way we would just need information that relates to a natural person without the identification requirement, which is a way that could protect the emotion or yeah, protect emotion data from being measured and exploited. So overall, turning back this the, the circle back to the question of can we ban AI? I still stand with my answer, no, we can't. Banning is always a last resort. We very rarely really ban anything. There are usually regulations that are more useful. 
but we ha still have to discuss if the other remedies that are in place or could be put in place in order to regulate AI or, in this case, immersion recognition technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katarina. That was a very, very clear presentation, both in the structure. I'm very grateful you stayed within the time. Um, when I was listening to your use cases for one moment, I thought, and this is just to get everyone awake, um, at CPTP, when you stand in the queue for the coffee, you know, if the, uh, if the emotion detection could go as far as saying, who needs it most desperate, the coffee? <laughs> and then there would be different lines. That would be maybe something that would be helpful. But now on a serious note, I think you have clearly pointed out the legal issue of uh, what consequence is it if we say the current definition, which is not that old, at least in the new uh, framework of GDPR, might not be suitable anymore. That's something I think we can discuss afterwards. We decided to do the following, because we've got three topics that are not directly interrelated. If you have a question, a question, not a comment yet, not a discussion comment to Katarina directly now, we will take one or two now. Otherwise, if it's more comment or general discussion, we will first follow up with the next presentation. So is there a question? Yes. And please go to the microphone and briefly say who you are. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Simeon Bauer. I'm an intern at Access Now. I do not represent my organization. Um, obviously, when we process emotions, we process information about the face. So it, it is processing of personal data, but often the justification is we do not store it, we erase it immediately. And so there are ways to sidestep um, concerns that you have raised. However, I want to ask a question. Instead of creating new categories of data that need to be protected, like emotions that do not necessarily relate to people, clearly, uh, should we not focus on the use that are made of data and the societal implications that these have? Thank you. Thank you. So the use of data instead of yeah. like the processing. Um, well, regarding your first part, um, of course, there is emotion recognition of facial features, which I also said that um, if the face is analyzed, it is always personal data, but there are also um, yeah, features that can be analyzed in order for the inference of emotions that are not as directly identifying, such as the heart rate or the body temperature or respiration rate. So, so there, that's, that's where I see the problem with, with the face, unless there is like, uh, yeah, I don't really see where the face should ever not be personal data. And um, the fact that it is not recorded, et cetera, does not circumvent the GDPR because the analy analysis itself is processing already, so you would need a legitimate ground for that already. Um, and then regarding your second question, um, I agree that we should um, look at the applications of technologies also rather than find new categories of, of data, but I feel that the regulation of certain technologies is not necessarily placed in data protection law. So we could, for this, we could look in consumer law or in the application for if law enforcement uses it, for example. So I would rather go sector specific in this regard and, um, and only regulate really data specific things in the data protection law. Okay, thank you. There's no other one, then we will move on uh, to Gian Claudio, who's also going to ask a very fundamental question um, right from the beginning, and I'm curious to see whether we have uh, more discussion ground after you have presented. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bart and Mark, for having me here. I'm in controversial panel for controversial topics. I'm going to address uh, AI and psychological integrity. I think it's quite timely after two full days of CPDP to talk about psychological integrity <laughs> and also after a, a, a late party yesterday and being here now, it's really a matter of psychological integrity for us. Uh, so uh, basically I think it's Actually, Mark was saying that the three presentations are not so much related, but I discovered that they are very much related because I'm also developing the points of emotions, looking more at fundamental principles and manipulation. I have to, sh to, to share with you a frustration. When we talk about AI, ADM, algorithmic decision-making, we have always this 
discourse on fairness related to discrimination. And the discourse is dominated by discrimination, stigmatization. Then we move a bit to manipulation, and then even in the manipulation discourse, electoral and political um, uh, semantic is dominating. Well, I want to address manipulation, but from the perspective of marketing manipulation. So something that in Europe <clears throat> is not so lucky in terms of regulation, because we are the liberal Europe, and of course, blocking marketing is something problematic. So um, I would like to, um, yeah, it's this one. Oh, where should I, where should I point uh, the clicker? Yeah, no, nothing up. Ah, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit, I just don't know where to point it. Battery, maybe? It's supposed to be anywhere because it's... Uh, it's uh, a bit slow. So, basically, we have... <clears throat> You know, the first studies on market manipulation were uh, at the end of uh, last century uh, in Harvard. So Hanson and Kaiser, they said, you know, if you go to a market and you find the price that is not $10, but is $9.99, this is the clearest cognitive bias that consumer will, uh, uh, will be targeted for, you know? And, uh, and now we, we know, uh, I mean, the first paper was of Ryan Kahlo, 2014, that... <clears throat> Manipulation with digital, in the digital world is even worse. Of course, we have a lot of data, we have big data, we have predictive analytics, etc. Meanwhile, the uh, behavioral law and economics have been developed a lot, and we all, we know how many, co or we <laughs> try to understand how many cognitive biases we have as consumers. <clears throat> So there's more awareness in research, but more potentialities in neuromarketing hmm? or uh, heuristics, etc. Uh, and since we were talking about emotion detection, I, I think we need to mention Damian Clifford, whose doctoral thesis was exactly about this, and, uh, and he wrote quite a lot of paper about the role of emotions in consumer law and data protection law. Um, but if the clicker allows, oh no, I'm pushing on the, <laughs> the fiction of functional rationality was for, 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 for the issue of the average consumer, no? So the rationality is a functional fiction. We, we think that, I mean, we need to affirm us as rational because we need, we are all market stakeholders and, but actually now we are more aware that this rationality is dysfunctional. We are so easily manipulatable and we, should understand how law can protect this. From fundamental rights to secondary law, I will try to, to, to look in this. So, uh, and here my frustration goes bigger because uh, we don't have so many uh, legal tools that specifically address the, the points of, on uh, uh, online manipulation. There was this white paper, very much discussed white paper of a non-EU country, maybe now we should say. And um, basically in this paper, in this white paper of uh, the, uh, of the uh, UK government, they tried to define different kinds of harms and one of these is online manipulation. And basically they have a very naive description of online manipulation and as you can see it's very much related to political uh, discourse. So they say, <coughs> You know, democracy needs not manipulation. And then they, here they say, uh, important is the distinction, I think this is meaningful, between legitimate influence and illegitimate manipulation. One billion dollar question, I think. Consumer law has tried to do this. We will see it in next slides. And then they say, ah, but look, we are, we are quite smart, huh? because in the 90s, we already had the Broadcasting Act as all the manipulation just happens in television, but I think it's quite, you know, a limited uh, approach to, 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 to the issue. So let's, let's look at uh, how manipulation can be, huh? because my, mental, mental integrity, how can we attack mental integrity? Hmm? I, <clears throat> I am like uh, taking uh, some uh, uh, preliminary reflections of uh, Claude Castelluccia from Hinria. He tried to compare uh, mental manipulation to machine manipulation. So let's think 
in a simplistic way that human mind can be as a machine learning system. We have three phases. We have the information injection phase, which is the education, uh, the learning phase, in which we receive information. Then we have the cognitive phase, in which we process information. And then we have the active phase, the action phase, in which we act based on the information that we received and that we processed. Mm? So basically, we can have three kinds of uh, manipulation related to, the, to these three different areas. We can have, in the information phase, we can have misinformation, malinformation, disinformation, all the narrative of fake news. Huh? I will not address this here, it's too big Pandora box. Then we have <clears throat> the second one, which is I think the most tricky one which is the uh, manipulation of the cognitive phase. So, exploiting cognitive biases, exploiting our human decision making. Huh? So, automated decision making, explaining human decision making, um, manipulating it. And then the action phase. So, I want to do something, but I cannot. Because the by design, architecture doesn't allow me to do that. So, for example, dark patterns, uh, the YouTube uh, uh, alert saying, uh, uh, do you want to register? Yes or not now? They never say no. <laughs> and this is a form of dark patterns in which your actions are somehow nudged. <clears throat> but let's look at uh, three uh, theoretical, uh, more or less scholarly definition of manipulation that I found so far. The first one is uh, Talzarsky paper was published in uh, Thiel, the uh, Theoretical Inquiries of Law, uh, last year. He tried to define manipulation into, uh, I mean, through different kinds of um, uh, proxies, let's say, or parameters. And uh, as you can see, his view of commercial manipulation is very much based on personal data processing. So he defines manipulation as personalized practices based on previously collected personal data. Uh, so the first column, huh? dynamic processes based on ongoing feedback, non-transparent mechanism, and advanced data analytics. So this was his view. I mean, as you can see, it's quite a procedural view. He's not taking into account the effects. He's taking into account the process of manipulation when processing personal data. Then we have the American definition of uh, Sasser and Nissenbaum. Uh, they define it quite um, uh, simply into three, uh, through three parameters. Manipulation practices needs to, have, needs to be targeting individuals, so targeted practices. The most important thing that they emphasize is that manipulation must be hidden. Because if we know, and I think this is also an American approach, saying that if I disclose you the fact that I am manipulating you, this is not manipulation, this is education or information or something, inducement, okay? So the hidden practice is very important for them. And then the exploitation of cognitive biases. And then we have the Council of Europe, um, um, let's say, definition. They wrote this paper about uh, political uh, uh, manipulation, but there were two lines uh, where they somehow define what manipulation is. And I think, uh, so I put all these three in comparison because I think there are interesting overlaps and differences. So Council of Europe, key characteristics of manipulation, say, the manipulation is the capacity to use personal and non-personal, is based on the capacity to use personal and non-personal data to sort and micro-target people. So very similar to the other two first points. So targeting practices, personalized practices. We all agree that online manipulation is based on hyper personalization. Then to reconfigure social environments in order to meet specific goals and vested interest. So this, this is more like changing the environment be, uh, around you. This is an, a, a different perspective, maybe similar to Talzarski view of dynamic processes and ongoing feedback. So an environment that every moment recreates itself, like in Minority Report movie, when we see the, we see the totem of advertising and it changes based on our emotions. And the last point was to identify individual vulnerabilities and exploit accurate predictive knowledge. I think that these two points here, so the exploit cognitive bias and identifying vulnerabilities is the real core of the potentiality of digital manipulation uh, today. Uh, but uh, if we compare this, and, I mean, you saw from the UK paper that there is this problematic, this problematic borderline between inducement and manipulation. Huh? This is one billion dollar question and uh, Baldwin, 
uh, try to define the types of influence. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a starting point for us, maybe. So we have four, just the, f the first four points. I added the fifth one just to give you know, the, <laughs> the other pole of, the, of, this, of this journey from uh, pure enhancing rational thinking to violence. So basically, there is this you know, nudging that becomes violence and this nudging that becomes illicit. I think that the focus of policymakers and lawyers and uh, scholars today is to understand where here the law takes action uh, and where consumer law, for example, uh, and here also criminal law, <laughs> can, take, uh, can play a role. Huh? So, um, uh, sorry for the title, interoperability issues, but uh, can privacy uh, be a solution against uh, manipulation? There was this paper, I don't know if you know this famous paper in, uh, published in uh, Nature uh, three years ago by two biotech guys, or bioethicists. Uh, so they proposed four new human sub-rights in the era of neuroscience. Uh, the right to cognitive liberty, mental privacy, mental integrity, and psychological continuity. So they derive from Article uh, 7 and 8 of the Charter and from 8 of the Convention, European Convention, uh, these four uh, rights that uh, try to address the issue of manipulation in the online world. Huh? I like to, to quote this uh, sentence from Wolpe saying that uh, actually privacy is not just our private life, but it's also our skull. You know, that's, the, I mean, the most uh, <laughs> uh, tricky thing that uh, usually we don't consider, but the problem of privacy is our mental privacy is the first basis of privacy. So, but... Um, yeah, so let's look at, uh, let's look at what the primary law um, affords. Huh? So we have, of course, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights with this big, it's broad interpretation because, of course, in the 50s, they couldn't imagine <laughs> everything that ha has happened today. And so the Strasbourg Court, using the, uh, uh, a, let's say, progressive approach, they put into the definition of Article 8, so in the uh, application of Article 8, 8, a lot of cases also including, yeah, also including mental um, uh, integrity. Um, then we have Article 3, 7, 8, and 10 of the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, and they all somehow can, can be a help because mental integrity uh, and freedom of thought are two different rights. So maybe if we have a, a joint reading of these different articles, we can have something meaningful. I will quote our organizer in his paper of 2018. He defined privacy as a protection, as the protection against aggressive and manipulative exposure of the secrets of the self. I think it's one of the most inclusive definitions. So I use it because it allows me to connect all these uh, four articles. But let's look at, uh, so I have two minutes and a half, I guess, and uh, I just uh, will try to show how GDPR and consumer law in two slides, it can be somehow a solution. So first of all, in GDPR, we have fairness of data processing, and again, I'm quoting Damien and Jeff. So the notion of fairness uh, can, of course, be a first uh, limit to manipulation. Uh, the, the title of this panel is, can we ban AI? I would reply, no, of course, but we can ban adverse effects of AI. We can mitigate or ban impact of AI, adverse impact of AI. And fairness is the first backstop tool that, that we have. The second one is lawfulness of data processing because, you, you know, to process sensitive data, you need some basis. And of course, manipulation is generally based on sensitive data and will not be easy. Lawfulness of purposes, because we, we sh I mean, this is an underestimated point, but purpose should be lawful and in manipulation, it's usually malicious. Risk to fundamental rights, another underestimated point. When we look at DPIA, when we look at risk, high risk of fundamental rights, we should move to human rights approach, not just cybersecurity. Let's look at uh, manipulation as a 
meaningful risk that we should mitigate during DPIA. I would not talk about DPIA, I give it for granted, we have no time to talk about that, but just, and maybe hard manipulation as an R. Uh, and then we have a secondary law, and I conclude with these two slides. Unfair Commercial Practice Directive of 2005 basically tried to define the borderline between accepted advertising and um, uh, manipulation. Hmm? And they say that borderline is impairing the consumer ability to make informed decision. How they reach this? If, I mean, the, 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 the test is if it materially distorts the economic behavior with regard to the product, the average consumer whom it reaches or to whom it's addressed. It's totally opposite to the approach that I showed you of Talzarski, uh, Susser, and COE. Because in this case, it's an effect, an ex post analysis of the effects. But how can we prove this? And also, they, the, the privacy scholars, say, if we just focus on effects, maybe there might be some manipulation that would not change our effect, but would reinforce our biases. So, yeah, and uh, so I conclude. And uh, the way forward, I have no solution today for you, but maybe we have two step, two, two ways forward. A clear list of harms that still miss, not the UK Mm, funny thing, <laughs> uh, with specific definitions to be included in what is manipulation, what is stigmatization, what is uh, discrimination, or taking the example of commercial uh, consumer law and a blacklist on unfair data processing. This is an unfair data processing uh, as manipulative because it, it does this and this. This is another, you know, th this might be two approaches uh, and pros and cons for both, but maybe we discuss in the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and I'm sorry that I had to interrupt you, <laughs> but we've still got the third presentation. Um, again, we can take one question, but I would like to point out one thing that is interesting, that already the question to our first speaker uh, indicated that we might have a problem here of what is ex ante and what is ex post. Where do we have to maybe turn our perspective into looking what comes out of the whole thing, which legally might be very challenging to do because the damage may be done if we say we only look at the adverse effect and not prohibit certain things from the beginning. So your last proposals were interesting and I think something to pick up afterwards. Any immediate question? That is fair of you because John talked a little bit longer so we don't use more time for the question and we'll do that afterwards then in the discussion. That's fine, John. So then we will um, hear Sylvia to, to round up the last of the um, presentations and then we go into questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry for the voice. I was at the party last night. Uh, oopsies. Valid excuse. Yeah. And... Um, um, I also do think that our presentations actually connect quite nicely and um, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, what I did when I realized that uh, before talking about how to intervene about AI in the home, I needed to understand what kind of attributes we were given to the home. So first of all, the answer to today's question um, I'm lazy. I don't necessarily want to ban all AI. I need some <laughs> of it. And I grew up with a lot of technology. But I also agree with my colleagues when we say that um, some uses, some applications are def... Uh, it went out. No, not with my voice. <laughs> the, the voice. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> some uses and some applications are actually to be strictly regulated and that we should not be afraid of discussing whether or not some of these uses can actually be completely banned. We are doing that with autonomous weapons. There is a discourse around, about that. And um, when we talk about AI inside one of the sanctuaries of the private sphere, I do think that we have to seriously reflect. But before we reflect about banning or not, let's try to understand what happens. And in order to understand what happens in the private sphere, I looked at um, behavioral sciences and captology. And then I will, I will explain what they are or what I looked at. Um, as a lawyer, so if some of you is an expert in this, have mercy on me. Um, I don't know if you've heard this news. Uh, it happened a few months ago. Uh, it was a big scandal because Apple, Google, and Amazon, through their vocal assistants, uh, were discovered to um, use basically uh, humans for support. So when the vocal assistant could not understand some of the things that were said to it, uh, they sent snippets to humans, whether employees or contractors, to solve the conflict. It's a general practice. 
um, but people didn't know, and that created a bit of a scandal. Uh, I'm going to be very cynic here and say that when I saw this, I was kind of happy because uh, I could use this as a test to see whether what I looked at could actually help understanding what was happening. What was the problem here? This is a general customer practice of the sector. Uh, it is known among people in the sector. Anyone working with natural language processing knows that humans help perfecting it. Um, and this is also Google's main defense in, with the general public, trying to explain them. It's, it's normal, really. There were some aspects here that were particularly creepy, like in the case of Amazon in particular, contractors <coughs> had access to even the address of the device. And, um, and this might be considered necessary in certain cases to solve the conflict. Sometimes if they're talking about, for example, a nearby shop, a certain name of a place, that can help. But this is also a thin line, especially for data protection in terms of minimization and um, data protection by design. So that would be a case by case on literally each information we're given analysis. And in general, while uh, one can argue that some provisions of the GPR can apply to actually limit this practice, uh, it would be only one side of the coin. It can also be argued that there is no clear cut um, obligation in the GDPR to insert this specific practice uh, among the information that have to be given. Same with consumer law. So why were people upset? People that owned those devices. Also, a, a little disclaimer, the reason why I'm working with these um, devices is for this presentation is because A, I'm working with them for my research, so I'm particularly familiar, and B, I think they represent the utmost level of AI that we introduce in the home right now. Um, more advanced than mere IoT devices. So let's go a little bit abstract for a minute and look at uh, some um, concepts borrowed from behavioral sciences. The moment we try to analyze the semantics of the house and of the home, so what are the conceptual attributes that we're giving to it, uh, we see that uh, we consider the house, the design, ab um, abstract but tangible, the box, okay? How we design the box in which we're gonna put our private sphere, basically. <coughs> the home is the intangible part. The two terms in English actually facilitate, particularly in my language, it would be the same term. And um, it's the emotional connection that we create with the box <laughs> that makes it a home. Dorothy helps us in this term to understand the difference. The connection is usually created through time and through uh, practices that are called appropriation. Uh, we choose the furniture, we choose the decoration. Even when we are renting, we try, we dispose objects in a certain way. We put our clothes in the, in the closet, even in a hotel room. We have these, uh, these mechanisms, a sort of nesting, that are um, spontaneous. And we try to create a connection with a certain location through them. This is called appropriation. Now, the own... So the emotional, the intangible aspect is considered the, the sanctuary, it's considered one of the, together with the body and <laughs> what Walt said, the, the skull, is considered one of the main places uh, where the private sphere, in, to which a private sphere is embedded and through which it can be protected also as a fiction by the law. Um, these attributes of appropriation and personalization make the home predictable. We can walk at night through our rooms, unless you have children or pets, <laughs> in which case, careful, in the dark, if we want to get a bottle of water or, or if we simply want to go answer the phone, we know where things are. We, we can walk, we, we hopefully won't bump into things. Um, we can relax, we can start um, unraveling, put down the mask from, you know, that we use in social life, the roles. We can sit however we want, eat whatever we want. And, um, and we start um, carrying out unselfconscious actions, which are actions that actually are um, um, spontaneously and they don't re um, carried out that they don't require a cost in terms of mental energy. Uh, so these are some of the attributes that behavioral science gives to the home and to the house that is a home. <laughs> um, Altman, however, 
uh, introduce a very interesting concept with crowding. Crowding is not how much pe how many people are physically present in a person. That's density in a no, in a person in a in a place. That's density. Crowding is a psychological perception of someone else's presence. And actually, the first time this was elaborated with regard not to the private sphere, but to the public sphere, when, for example, we are in a natural park in the wilderness and we want to be alone, but we see traces of someone else's campsite, even if we don't see those people. This is how Altman elaborated the concept of crowding. We are annoyed because we thought and we wanted to be alone and we thought we would be, but someone else was there. Altman analyzed this concept and found out that the, um, it's a psychological reaction to a loss of connection. So we're breaking that appropriation and that emotional connection that we have created with the home or with the private sphere. And it is associated with lower levels of control. In order for the home to be predictable, in order for us to trust what's in the home and for it to be completely tailored on us, we need to have high levels of control on it. So for example, there have been interviews of people uh, whose houses have been uh, burglarized and that was interrupting the emotional connection and lowering the levels of controls and was exposing them. So this is crowding. Um, as a reaction to crowding, we start uh, doing territorial reality, we put fences, curtains, or we verbally express uncomfortableness or with behaviors. We, there, is a set, there, there are a lot of uh, reactions that have been analyzed by behavioral scientists. Now, my idea is that the moment we introduce AI, it's an object, so it's supposed to not give us crowding because it's supposed to be an inanimate object, but there, capability of reaction and the permeability that derives from the fact that they're constantly collecting and sending out data and adapting to them might create the feeling of having less control on the home. Um, my idea is therefore that we can put this kind of AI inside the home in between inanimate objects and um, family members so they, they can create at times uh, a certain degree of crowding and it's also it, it also matches the marketing strategies of these devices, because they're the new family member most of the time. Uh, Shapiro talks about placement and permeability that make certain um, practices acceptable, a context, right? You can say certain things in a certain context and not say them in another one. Um, with my supervisor, we also add the concept of pers persistent, because the, um, the presence during time of a technology that um, adapts and builds on our personality might with time create this loss of control. So uh, I've created two possible scenarios. In the alert scenario, we have an AI inside the home and um, we remember that we have an AI inside the home and all of a sudden we uh, no longer um, say certain things in front of the smart TV or we no longer go around semi-naked at night because we remember that the security camera is actually gonna uh, record and store that. So there is a chilling effect. So the, the mechanism, the reaction to crowding is the one of changing behavior with a chilling effect. There is also the peripheral vision scenario in which we forget that these devices actually are going to be reactive and responsive and collect and personalize. And our perceived control, we don't perceive crowding, but our perceived control is actually not, um, doesn't match the actual control that we have about how these informations and how our private sphere is exposed. And here is when the episode that we saw of the people listening to snippets from uh, Alexa and Google Assistant created a feeling of uncomfortableness because all of a sudden the misperception emerged and we um, experienced crowding. We realized that we had less control than we thought of on our private sphere. And this was why cynically I actually uh, smiled at the, at the case because I thought, oh look, Crowding applies here. Um, there are other things that also uh, help eroding our connection, like rationalization and commodification. And as a result, we, uh, the, 
the tangible aspect, the design, the efficiency um, stance, the multitasking, they emerge on the home. But our private sphere was not made for being necessarily efficient, it was not made for multitasking. Our private sphere was made for unraveling and develop our personalities. And we don't know in the long term what this extreme rationalization and commodification of the home is gonna uh, result in terms of our identity construction. Um, do we have to do something about it? I don't know, because we have negotiated what is private and what is public during time, during centuries, and uh, this is just a new <laughs> element to negotiate. But I do believe that awareness that this is happening helps us decide where we want to draw the line and negotiate in terms of uh, individuals with our community. And if we don't have this awareness, what we're going to regulate is inevitably going to fall a little bit short. In the last minute, I'm just going to add one thing from the other part, and it's captology. And this connects to what uh, John Claudio was saying. In the 90s, Fogg created the functional triad of captology because he knew, he, being a computer scientist, that computer scientists and, and programmers use persuasive permission and pervasive features of softwares to steer behaviors, to persuade. And he said, some things can be tools, so they have a low level of persuasion. Some things can be mediums through which we experience reality, and they can have a higher degree of persuasion. And some um, computers can be social actors, in which case they have the same level of persuasion than another human being would have on us. Um, Nas and Stewart, uh, Nas was uh, the pupil of uh, Fogg, building on that created the computer as social actor theory, and they added that when there is vocal interaction, what we need to actually um, anthropomorphize and um, associate a set of social norms to a machine is a very minimum set of standards. We need something that might even vaguely resemble human voice, basically. So. Voice is a catalyst of a mechanism called ethopoeia. And ethopoeia increases the capability of persuasion of these devices. Now, guess what? We have um, voice interaction with, um, social, with um, personal assistance. And a voice interaction that is extremely realistic in terms of, human, of imitation of human voice. Um, these, I believe, if we use the philosophical theory of technology mediation of reality means that these devices and the voice interaction that we have with them uh, are gonna influence how we attribute meanings to things around us. If we have a hammer, you, you're gonna want to just nail everything to the floor, right? If you have a vocal assistant telling you things inside your private sphere, we might start to change what we define as private sphere and the meanings and the attributes that we associate to it. Um, and this is also what they're kind of aiming at, and how are we going to redefine, this is I think one of the last ones, and I'm going to skip the others, uh, how are we going to redefine it, why are they redefining it and introducing what? Well, they're going to introduce stances of marketing and of their own corporations behind it, and this is why Alexa has an entire team elaborating its personalities, and um, the, f the head of that team clearly says it has the Google personality which means that inside our house, we're gonna introduce Google's stances of what's the private sphere for Google. And uh, we, my idea is that we risk to move from what Kumar was uh, describing as the democracy of the microwave in the 90s with television and radio to the democracy of the smart microwave and we don't know what that is really. So I don't know <laughs> what we have to do about it. <laughs> Again, I don't have answers. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry for the overtime. I think you could guess that uh, we were not expecting any single one of the presenters to actually finally answer the question, can we ban AI? Um, but I will uh, reinforce the question in a moment. Just again, if there's anything, there was this one expression I've tried to memorize, but I can't even... Ethio... So, for example, if you have a further question on that, we can take first a question. If not, we will enter into the discussion. And, all three of you, I think, very, um, in, in very clear terms showed that we, we have a, an intrusion of privacy happening, which is reinforced by AI technology, which is, 
are much, much bigger than a lot of the issues we had. For example, when we were discussing Internet of Things a few years ago here, saying, oh, it's a bit creepy if the fridge starts ordering more butter because you, it discovers you have no butter. Well, it's more creepy to say some, something is telling you you should have put butter on your bread because your face looks as if the, it's not tasteful. Or, or actually having devices in your home which feel alien. Like you said uh, now, it's, you had the picture of a, a burglary and, and, and the result. Um, interestingly, none of you said, and that is why there are certain things that we should not allow. Maybe you, John, said there should be a blacklist of certain things. Mm -hmm. um, is that because it's anyway going to happen, like with the IoT? Or is it because it is too difficult to conceive a way to prohibit it? Or do you all think, no, no, it is okay as long as we kind of frame it? So, Let's move from can we ban AI to should we ban AI for each of the areas that you mentioned. Well, um, I see this idea of banning a technology as whole in general very critical. As Sylvia said, there is a ban on autonomous <laughs> weapons and that is a really high threshold to reach for other AI. So. I think it's really critical to, to see, because autonomous weapons have no possibly positive impact on individuals, but many other AI applications have positive or negative applications. So emotion recognition can be very useful in several fields, such as healthcare, for example, or they, there may be legitimate uses even in marketing. So I would say, it, a general ban is, is, as I said, always a last resort kind of situation. So I would say do not ban it just because it's creepy. Mm -hmm. But John, your, your uh, presentation did indicate that it's going into the way that we as persons stand if there is too much AI influence. You called it uh, mental integrity. Um, so, so, indeed, a weapon maybe can kill physically, but potentially changing personalities is also quite, um, quite a game changer. So, yeah, yeah, no, and I, I think uh, the you know the the hidden uh, aspect of uh, of manipulation is exactly that one that you cannot prove that manipulation was at stake. So, also for the previous question about should we and how can we limit etc. Uh, I, I don't know, this blacklist that I, I, I don't know, I was guessing, I was proposing, uh, should, I mean, would need some clearer definitions of, and some clearer parameters, of course. Um, so, uh, we all agree that hyper-personalization based on our vulnerabilities is unfair and should be probably for malicious intents, and malicious I mean marketing, should be probably limited. Uh, probably there is a consensus on that, but wh wh how we define vulnerability. Uh, so I think the study should be on that. And also um, on the accountability sphere, sphere. So, for example, all this discussion about explainability of AI, etc. No, I think we now, after three years of uh, fighting about the notion, we should justify, not explain algorithms. And uh, I, I think my, my, my two cents is let's revert the burden of proof and let's ask controllers to explain why they and how their algorithm is not manipulative. How and why they are not using. <coughs> vulnerability uh, information. I make just an example of vulnerability. Uh, one of us has lost his dog and he receives behavioral advertising based on, uh, for shoes with a dog and a man and is more exposed to that. Or in the US there were cases of self-defense for raped women. These are all cases of vulnerability. We all agree that it's not, that we should ban them. Mm. So, but, yeah. Okay, but so there is, there, there, there you do plead clearly to say that if we can define a list, then that should be out, but m not as an outright ban, but to say these, are, these overstep the limits of what we can tolerate. No? Mm. So yeah, you, you, you very impressively showed 
um, uh, also in the last slide, well, Google's personality, because everything feels Google-like. And, and, and you, I think that voice recognition thing, I, I was surprised how short the attention span was, because first everyone was going like, this is unbelievable, they're listening to people having sex. More intimate is not possible, and then after four weeks, I was kind of, okay, it's over, everyone admitted they're doing it. And now the question would be, did it change anything? They all said, we're going to freeze it for a few months, or how long? So even though you quite impressively showed the intrusion into the private home has taken place to the maximum amount possible behind the bedroom doors, um, you, you still said, it, it, there is no such thing as my home is my castle for AI. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my problem with the idea of, for example, banning these kind of devices inside the private sphere is um, mostly, um, I mean, I don't have a problem with banning things <laughs> in general if, they're, if they're, uh, there isn't a, har a harm. My problem is that um, here we go to the same discourse that we would have with alcohol, we would have with certain, um, like smoking or certain drugs, and that's where I feel more uncomfortable in saying banning or not, because there, people are loving their devices. And, and they, uh, so far we are at a level of diffusion where a lot of people have it, especially in the United States, here they're gaining popularity, but it's not, there is no social pressure in having it and there is no necessity in having it. I, I think it might like, happen in the near future in five to 10 years. My problem is gonna be in that moment because um, if we leave the choice to people to either having it or not, so we don't make it an essential item to even carry out certain essential services and activities, I am fine. But it would be like, you know, uh, banning alcohol or banning or, or imposing, you know, <laughs> something like drinking as a necessary activity. So that's my, my, my problem here is between people wanting it and, and who are we to actually restrict, even if people want to damage themselves, I, I do put a limit to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the actual, let's leave a choice, let's create a society in which we have it, and also let's, let's inform people of what is actually behind it. Mm -hmm. and, and here is where marketing and, and the way these devices are actually presented to the public, that is a bit shady, and I would definitely correct that. Mm -hmm. But that, that brings me, it's great, because that was one of the questions I had is to say, with certain other choices that people could make over the last three or five decades, policymakers decided, well, but you don't really know the long-term effect. And that's why you can't. Because like, you, you, didn't, you maybe didn't know that smoking is bad for you, but we do now. No? Because, so basically we say we, you're not allowed to advertise for it because it, the, the problem, the way you described it is there may be a more long-term effect, you know? Like uh, you get used to trying to hide your facial expression because you're afraid that otherwise you will be overwhelmed. You don't know that at the beginning you might think it's a great device. So the question that, you, that, that I would put forward to you is, can we, like with medication for example, when there's an advertisement for medication, side effects, <coughs> please ask your doctor, is that something we should do and say, okay, because th this type of um, use of AI goes to a point that you may not immediately spot. It's not like you take your device and you know what it will have for an effect. There has to be some disclaimer, you know, further information can be found here, or warning, you know, if before you use this advice. Is, is that something that is realistic? Um, so instead of banning it, to, to foresee it with warning signals like you just said, or is that not going to work? Maybe, Jan, you first, because you, you even suggested to say, no, we'd rather have a blacklist. Yeah, I appear like the paternalistic here, but <laughs> actually, I think information has made this time, and, uh, you know, uh, notice and consent is something that uh, is clearly a bit in ineffective today. I think accountability should be in place. Uh, I'm ver a big fan of DPIA because the mm. controllers are really forced, I mean, and then we should check how is the, DP how is the DPA check on DPIA, so what the authorities, how authorities are checking. But there you really see, huh? I mean, the, the data controller has the capability, huh? sometimes money and, <laughs> and, and people, to analyze risk and assessing them. Information, we all have a lot of information. Uh, we don't use that. There is the information fallacy, no? 
the fallacy that we can deal with them and this overrepresentation of ourselves as reader and informed reader and circumspect, the all the average, all the average consumer uh, Akina. So I think that uh, information is something, of course, necessary, but the balancing of interests should be done by controller. I don't know. <laughs> this is That's clear. Okay, since we are already now getting close to the end of our panel, now it's your turn. Questions, or in this case, also comments that may come from your side. Yes, and please, uh, as usual, introduce briefly and then at the microphone. Ah, thanks, Jenny. You were quoted as well. Yes, I saw. <laughs> My name is Simone van der Hoff, Leiden University. And uh, yeah, I, I think it, this is fascinating. Uh, so I, I actually have a lot of questions and comments, but uh, let's stick to uh, to. to uh, first to the first presenter. Sorry, I came in late, so I didn't uh, hear the complete presentation. Um, uh, but you talked about, uh, I, I gathered from what you said, uh, about emotion, emotional AI. And, and you made the uh, comparison with autonomous weapons, which I understand, because they're sort of at the other end of, uh, of things that we think, okay, uh, they're not good, they're maybe evil. And um, But when it comes to emotional AI, you were sort of... Uh, not sure whether we should ban it or not. Um, we had a first session at CPDP, we had a very, one of the very first on emotional AI. And um, it was also about the precautionary principle and the fact that uh, emotional AI, uh, the way it's being done today, is not effective at all because we can't really read emotions yet. I'm, I'm saying yet, I hope we never can, but mm. uh, at, at this point, the science is not that far, so they're using very simplistic models and, and things like So my, my question would be, w with that in mind, uh, would your answer still be the same? Uh, and say, okay, I'm not really sure, they're good things, they're bad things, keeping in mind that we, we can't actually read emotions, uh, and it's not an effective technology, which is also... <laughs> Um, and, and also, if you take it to the proportionality princ principle, which is underlying a lot of fundamental rights, and, and which is exactly also about that. And then uh, maybe one uh, quick question to, to Sylvia, uh, because you, I, I really liked you, you know, uh, tying it in with all these concepts and also crowding, you know, the feeling of creepiness and, and feeling uncomfortable with things. Uh, but on the other hand, we know from surveillance study that there is also a normalization process and I could gather, I, I, I can relate to this feeling of creepiness. I don't have Alexa in the home or any other device because just because of this, you know, but I do have the smartphone, of course, so it's not really. <laughs> but um, uh, did you look into this as well and is there any scholarly work, because this is mostly about the public domain and CCTV, is there anything related to also these kinds of, of devices and to what extent they're actually normalizing uh, um, uh, the feeling of, uh, you know, normalizing uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, not even seeing it anymore and, and thinking it's okay, actually. Uh. Before you answer the two of you, we'll take the second question and then we can wrap up. Thanks, Simon. This question is a little bit uh, to your uh, question about labeling or warning about the long-term effects. And my question is, uh, is there, uh, can that be enough? Because uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, such technology gets out of control. So uh, as an individual, I can consent to my data, but uh, if I have an Alexa at home and I have visitors, do, do they have uh, agreed uh, with my consent? If I go around and have my smartphone uh, picking up every conversation around me, did I consent to have their, con, uh, mm -hmm. their uh, discussions? So should we not talk about banning uh, stuff where the consent may be uh, not in the hand of the one that is asked for consent? Okay, thank you very much. So I suggest we do Katarina, Sylvia, and then John, same time the concluding remarks. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I also see this, um, well, you mentioned the, the shaky scientific foundation, this emotional recognition is built upon. And I also see that very critically because psychologists do not agree on how emotions 
really work. We do not know that yet. So the whole background is still still based on, on ideas. The basic emotion theory is decades old. So, so it's, it's really difficult, but we have a, a, a development that uses contextual data more and more. So I, I believe while we will, might never be at the point where we can say this is exactly the emotion, we can infer from the contextual data together with such things such as facial um, expressions, at least a tendency of emotions. So, it, so, so I, I think we're not at the end yet of the development there. And yes, of course, it is really critical, but I find it hard to say we should ban emotion recognition simply on the fact that the psychological foundation or the foundation of the science psychology is, is not yet completely discovered because there might be still useful cases where it not, does not have to be that elaborate or where we have different um, groups that, where we have general remark or general inferences from, from emotions. Yeah. Thank you. Sylvia? Um, thank you for both questions. Uh, to answer quickly, Simon, um, actually I haven't found anyone in surveillance studies that has carried out an analysis of these devices. They are so brand new in terms of diffusion that I think it's going to come in a few years. But uh, <clears throat> Kashmir Hill and, uh, and uh, Hill and Matu, uh, the article that I was quoting for the peripheral vision, that is actually a general public article on Gizmodo. And I think that they nail these things that you were talking about, about surveillance and the marketing and non-marketing implications. So I would definitely, it's called The House That Spied On Me. And that one is a great, even general public reading. And um, uh, to answer your question, also your remark about um, um, uh, labeling or other forms of <laughs> interventions we can have or like, um, um, somehow some cautionary messages. In the case of the home and, and of these devices, I don't see how that could work at all because it's not like I can say, uh, warning, this device might change how you see your house, your home in 10 years. It doesn't work. Um, actually, what I think works here is that uh, we uh, keep the distance between uh, the producers and the providers of services connected to these devices and the state and the public authority, oh no, please. And the public authority keeps um, intensely overseeing this and protecting from possible harms coming from that. We have to put this back into the legislator, I think, because we need to leave people free to still enjoy these devices for the extent that we want to without them having um, undesired effect from it because of a business model, because this is what is happening here. So, no, I would actually option for more overseeing. Thank you. John, you get the last 40 30 seconds. seconds. 30 seconds on consent. Um, I think that GDPR is great in giving us Article 7 about freedom of consent, because now consent must be free, I mean, even before, but here there is more emphasis. The EDPB has often said in the last months that consent sometimes is not free, not just in the, in the commercial uh, realm, but also in research, for example. So, uh, uh, just to quote again Simone van der Hoff and uh, Leiden, <laughs> I would suggest to read the paper The Crisis of Consent, where really we see how consent is a problematic issue that we are over abused in the last months, uh, years. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, John, because it also gives us uh, more food for thought and continued reading. I would like uh, you all to join me in thanking the three um, panelists. I think it was great what you've uh, uh, laid out, and I think we might get back to these topics in the coming years at CPDB. So thank you for being here to you, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.